Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our virtual meeting on the Extremely Low Probability of Rupture, or XLPR, Probabilistic Fracture Mechanics Code Models Overview. My name is Matthew Homiak. I'm the NRC's lead in the Office of Nuclear Regulatory Research for the XLPR program. XLPR is, is a joint venture with the Electric Power Research Institute, or EPRI. My counterpart from EPRI, Craig Harrington, is also with us today. Supporting the meeting, our members from the NRC staff, EPRI staff, and some of our contractors. Purpose of the meeting today is to provide an overview of the models in the XLPR version 2 code. This is a follow-on to our April 23rd XLPR code pre-release meeting. At that meeting, we announced the pending public release of the code and provided an overview of the code request process. We also provided perspectives from NRC and EPRI senior management and from those involved in code development from the beginning. We highlighted some of the code's features and provided a live demonstration. We also discussed some areas of code applications, present and future, and announced plans for future series of webinars surrounding the XLPR version two code release. And the meeting today is the next in that series. The meeting on April 23rd was recorded, and you can watch a video of it on youtube.com. There's also an NRC meeting summary. If anyone at the meeting here today missed the April 23rd meeting, please feel free to reach out to me, and I'd be happy to point you to some of those materials so you can watch it. Whereas the uh, April 23rd meeting was more high level, today we'll be uh, getting into some more details and technical content about the, go the code. The goal is to provide technical details about the models programmed into the code so that prospective users can gain a better understanding of its capabilities. Uh, our agenda here for today we're currently in the uh, introduction and opening remarks portion. And I'll use the remainder of that time to tell you a little bit more about the XLPR version 2 point release and what that includes. Then we'll provide a general overview of the code and we'll cover each of the deterministic models one by one. Those include the loads and stresses, stress intensity factors, fatigue and stress growth cracking initiation models, crack growth and crack coalescence, crack transition, crack opening displacement, leak rate calculations, crack stability, and in-service inspection. We'll round that out with dedicated time for questions and answers. And then we'll have uh, closing remarks and adjourn. This is an NRC Category 3 public meeting, which means the public is invited to participate by providing comments and asking questions throughout. Today, we're using the WebEx platform to deliver the meeting, and I'd encourage everyone to participate through WebEx so you can see the slide presentation. And this is also how we'll primarily plan to take your questions. So you'll get the best experience using WebEx. In WebEx, you can submit your questions and comments at any time using the Q&A feature. We want to make sure that's displayed on your screen. The Q&A feature looks differently depending on whether you're using WebEx in your internet browser or through your desktop client. For the web browser, you can access the Q&A by clicking on the question mark bubble located between the speech bubble and the three dots. That's shown on the left here in the screen. The desktop client, you first click on the three dots and then select the Q&A button. I showed here on the right of the screen. Either way you do it, you should display a Q&A box on the right side of the screen. And this is just a note that uh, we're using the Q&A today. This is different from the way we took questions at the April 23rd meeting where we're using the chat feature. So remember, today we're using Q&A feature for questions and answers. We received a lot of excellent questions from the April 23rd meeting. In fact, so many so that we weren't able to keep up with all of them. Uh, so in response today, in the background, we've got a five-person team 
uh, to help answer any questions you may have, so feel free to ask away. After the meeting, we'll issue a summary, which will be available on NRC's public website, and we'll also be recording this meeting, and we'll make it available on youtube.com as well. That covers my administrative items for the meeting. And now, a little on the XLPR version 2.1 release. So as mentioned, we had the pre-release meeting on April 23rd. We announced that we would be releasing the code, uh, version 2.1. Um, we have a slight delay in releasing the version. Uh, there's some technical issues we're trying to grapple with now, but it's it's very soon to be publicly available. Um, and we'll issue an announcement when that happens. It's going to be available for request again on the NRC public website and to the EPRI's public websites. And I'll go through each of those processes quickly. After this, um, the code is free for requesters, but they'll need to sign a an user license agreement and also meet certain uh, citizenship requirements. Assuming a request is approved, instruction will be sent to access the code, code through a secure file transfer site. So now on the uh, NRC side, Okay, on the NRC side, this is a NRC public website. You go to the research on the left-hand side there. Yep, and that'll display the uh, content here in the middle of the screen. You would click on the link there, obtaining the codes. XOPR will be listed at the bottom um, and instructions will be provided um, for accessing the code. On the EPRI side, Go to EPRI.com, you search for XLPR um, on the EPRI website, and it would display in a list of results. And then you would look for XLPR version 2.1 and select it from the list. And follow the instructions uh, on a page that's would look similar to this. So this is not XLPR page. Um, this is an example of sort of what it'll look like. Okay, now a little bit about what um, you're gonna get in XLPR version 2.1. This is a snapshot of the actual release package itself. I'm gonna go from the top down here. Uh, the first one being a folder uh, that's gonna contain uh, some uh, input databases, materials, wealth residual stress profiles, um, things like that. Uh, the DLLs folder contains all the modules that the code uses. Those are what we'll be covering today, actually what the actual uh, physical models that are programmed into each one of those, those modules. Uh, the next folder is the sim editor. That's uh, the GUI for the code. There's a folder on the training materials. Talk about that in a little bit. Um, the other folder is XLPR main. That's the main folder that contains the old SIM files and input set spreadsheet. So that's, that's what you'll be getting in XLPR version 2.1. So what's, uh, what's going to be made available uh, in terms of training materials in the code? Uh, available to everyone is going to be the video, video recording from this meeting today, also the video recording and presentation materials uh, from the April 23rd meeting, uh, and some of the XLPR development related reports. We've had some requests for, for information about the code. Uh, there's plenty documented in those. We're going to make those publicly available uh, very soon. And also available to XLPR users will be the user manual, um, as well as a couple of different training manuals. So here's a snapshot of uh, one of these training manuals. 
call it the theory training manual. It has uh, several different lessons here, well, many different lessons actually, uh, covering the different modules in the code. It's basically a two and a half day version of what we're going to be giving you today. Uh, so there's plenty of additional details uh, in there as well on the theory behind the code. And you'll have some links to some pre-recorded uh, pre session of that course, um, also available again on YouTube. So this, as I mentioned, is part of a series of webinars surrounding XLPR code release. Focus today is a high-level overview of the XLPR and its underlying deterministic models. We're going to have several other seminars, which I'll talk about a little bit more at the end of the thing, um, on setting up the inputs, running the simulations, and accessing the results. Those are tentatively scheduled for July. Um, what, what we're going to do with those is set those up when uh, we start actually getting uh, licensed users of the code. So those those are going to be user focused training sessions, um, whereas the meeting today and the one on the 23rd is more providing general information about the code. Greg, uh, would you like to add anything? Thank you, Matt. Just just a couple quick comments. Uh, I, I really want to thank everyone for your participation today. Uh, we do hope that you will find this information useful. XLPR is a complex tool. It will require an investment of your time to really learn it and be able to apply it effectively. But we do expect that users will come to appreciate the flexibility that it offers um, for analyses that uh, fall within its capabilities. Uh, I apologize for the slight delay here in, in the release of the code. Uh, we've had a lot of, of moving parts to get to this point, but then in addition at the end, this, this product is an unusual product to be released through epri.com and that's uh, that's created its own hurdles and challenges that we've been working through so we're almost there uh, it actually sort of is out there on epri.com it's just not everybody can get to it it's not readily apparent yet so we're working through some final last minute technical details so bear with us for another day or so, and uh, I expect that we'll have it up. As Matt said, we will make sure that uh, an announcement goes out, especially to this group that is participating on the call today. Um, so with that, uh, let me get out of the way and turn this back to, to Matt and our presenter. Okay. Uh, thank, thanks, Craig. So. Uh... Look for an announcement soon uh, on XLPR version 2.1 release. We had um, folks attending this meeting. We have your email addresses, so you'll receive an announcement um, any day now. Okay, uh, now on to the meat of our meeting today. I'd like to introduce Marcus Burkhart. He'll be doing most of the presenting today. Marcus is a senior engineer at Dominion Engineering Incorporated. Uh, he's supporting the XLPR efforts under contract to EPRI. Marcus has supported development of a number of the XLPR models and inputs as one of the more experienced XLPR users. And then backing up, we have a, a team of other people that includes Craig and myself as the XLPR program managers will be helping out with the Q&A. Uh, part of that team is Dr. Cedric Salaberry. He's a mathematician at Engineering Mechanics Corporation, under contract to NRC. We also have Nathan Glunt from the EPRI staff and Marge Erickson from Phoenix Phoenix Engineering Associates. She's under contract to EPRI. Marge was the lead of the models group during XLPR version two development, so she brings a lot of good information. And then we also have Giovanni Facco from the NRC staff. He's helping out with WebEx today. Uh, if you're having any difficulties with your WebEx setup, um, feel free to reach out to him through the chat feature. 
thanks again for everyone for being here today. We're looking forward to the meeting. Um, just a rem reminder to use the Q&A feature today to submit your questions. Okay. With that, Marcus, why don't you take it away? All right, thank you, Matt. Um, so now I will jump into the technical portion of today's presentation, starting out with an overview of XLP. So there are several parts that come together to make XLP. Um, first, uh, inputs need to be provided uh, using either an Excel input file or using Stim Editor, which can be used to generate the inputs that go into the Excel input. Um, the preprocessor is then run on the inputs in the input set to generate lookup tables um, for two, two preprocessors, Leopold and Tiffany. The Goldson framework is then used to run the actual XLPR simulation. The framework manages all of the probabilistic aspects of XLPR, including data management, sampling, model evaluation, aleatory and epistemic looping, and generating output statistics. It then also provides a user-friendly graphical tabular view of the outputs and of calculated intermediate variables. So as I mentioned on, on the prior slide, there are two ways to provide inputs to XLPR. The Sim Editor job application provides a, a user-friendly way to generate the input set. Um, Whereas more advanced users may want to use the input spreadsheet, which is directly editable. In the XLPR 2.1 release, several input libraries are provided, which contain example input values for various volume residual stress profiles um, or material properties. So the two, in, uh, the two preprocessors that are run from within the input set are Tiffany and Leopold. Tiffany stands for thermal stress intensity factors for any pool in history and generates lookup tables for stress and stress intensity factor K values based on plant transients. These lookup tables are utilized for the fatigue initiation and growth models. Leopor stands for leak analysis of piping opioids. Uh, the lookup tables calculated using Leopor provide calculated leak rates as a function of crack length and crack opening displacement. The XLPR framework is the center point of the analysis, handling information flow and linking the deterministic submodels together. The Colson itself is a uh, graphical user interface based probabilistic programming software that takes a dynamic simulation engine and embeds it within a Monte Carlo probabilistic simulation framework. Various random sampling options are available, including simple random sampling, Latin hypercube sampling, an important sampling, which can be applied to specific portions of distributions for key inputs of interest. The framework also handles sampling of variables in one of two loops, either the epistemic loop, which is the outer loop, or the aleatory loop, which is the inner loop. The user can specify in which loop each variable is sampled. Uh, GoldSim also includes several tools for executing realizations in parallel, helping improve runtime. The framework tracks variables for all, or tracks values for all variables that are then passed between the modules. So in GoldSim, you have the option to save values for each of those variables. And that is very useful for understanding the results that you're receiving from XLP as well as for debugging any sort of problem that you're trying to model. And finally, through the framework, you're able to access the simulation results, and you can view those graphically or in a tabular form, and either as statistics or on a realization by realization. So what does a component modeled with an actual PR look the model is focused around a wells connecting two components. And in XLPR, those are similarly uh, simply called left pipe and right pipe. And then for application of XLPR to leak before break, which were the primary locations of interest um, during development, um, 
That's kind of what the, the problem is focused around. So each of these parts or materials, uh, left pipe, right pipe, and wells, are considered to be distinct and separate inputs to be provided to SLPR, each of these materials. Not shown in the figure, um, but also included in XLTR is a mitigation material, which can be used for modeling components that have inlays and overlays. The circumference of the component in XLTR is broken up into a number of discrete subunits. For crack initiation, all flaws are modeled to in initiate within the wells with up to one axial and one circumferential flaw within a given subunit. All axial cracks are modeled to exist in different planes and do not coalesce with each other. Once axial cracks reach the boundary of the wells, they can either be modeled to rest or to continue propagating into the base metal using the appropriate crack growth rate equations for that material. And so selecting which, which option occurs there is an input that's provided to the user. Circumferential cracks are all modeled to exist within the axial center line of the wells. As they are in the same plane, they may coalesce. So I'll be touching more on the XLPR coalescence models later in this presentation. For time evolution in XLPR, uh, the user inputs a simulation duration. Uh, the time step is set to a default of one month, but that is a setting that can be changed by the user within the plane. There are certain inputs that are applied based on the operating periods and the mitigation status, which are all additional uh, user inputs to XLPR. Up to three time-based operating periods can be modeled. For each operating period, the user can define separate inputs with either constant or distributed values for pressure, temperature, dissolved oxygen, loads, and stresses. The user can also set a time at which mitigation is applied. So this could either be chemical mitigation in which changes to zinc or hydrogen concentrations are applied, or it could also be physical mitigation, such as mechanical stress improvement, weld overlay, or inlay onlay, in which inputs for geometry, welding residual stress profiles, um, in-service inspection model parameters, and material properties can be updated. So I, I mentioned um, that either chemical or mechanical mitigation options can be applied. Um, both, uh, yeah, you can apply either one or both at the same time. Um, for each mitigation technique, the time at which the mitigation starts is input to XLPR. So at a maximum, you could have a different mitigation start time for zinc, a different start time for hydrogen, and a different start time for the mechanical mitigation technique. For zinc mitigation, the zinc concentration is updated, which can have an impact on the calculated PWSEC in the CO2 time. For hydrogen mitigation, the dissolved hydrogen concentration is updated, which can impact the PWSEC growth rate. Mechanical mitigations can make more significant changes within the model. Uh, mechanical stress improvement results in an update to the welding residual stress profiles and an update to the probability of detection models. Weld overlay results in changes to the wall thickness, material properties, stress profiles, and probability of detection. Any present through-all cracks are also modeled to become surface cracks with depths equal to the original pipe wall thickness. An inlay onlay results in changes to the stresses, geometry, material properties, probability of detection, and also resets the number of cracks to zero. So here are some general references uh, that are available to XLPR users that are useful for trying to find more general information. Um, the XLPR user manual and the XLPR training manual for the code theory will be included within the XLPR release. 
and then the, um, the computational framework uh, report and the inputs group report um, will, will be made available separately at a later time. So now we'll jump into more detail on the deterministic models built into XLPR. So XLPR models both axial and circumferential frames. And all cracks are assumed to initiate on the component uh, inner diameter. Part through all cracks, as shown on the left, are modeled as semi-elliptical surface flaws. After drawing through wall, cracks are then treated as transitioning through wall flaws or trapezoidal through wall flaws, which you can see in the center set of figures. Unlike uh, shown in the figure here, um, they're treated as trapezoids rather than ellipsoids. And then after some period of through wall growth, the transitioning through wall flaws eventually become idealized through wall flaws with equal inner and outer diameter lengths for the case of axiom cracks, or equal inner and outer um, diameter angles for the case of circumferential cracks. So XLPR was built to be modular based. So there are numerous submodels built into XLPR with the intent of if there are any future developments to these models, they can be swapped out for updated models relatively easily. XLPR is focused on modeling the development of cracks within components, such as the similar metal piping bubbles. The submodels that were developed for XLPR help do this. So first, cracks are modeled to initiate. Once the cracks have initiated, crack tip stress intensity factors are calculated, which then feed into crack growth. For transients, Tiffany calculates the corresponding delta K values, which results in fatigue crack growth. As cracks grow, they have the potential to coalesce if they are multiple circumferential cracks that are sufficiently close to each other. For transitioning through wall cracks, the crack transition model calculates adjustments to the K and crack opening displacement solutions. Crack opening displacement is then calculated and fed into the leak rate calculation performed by Leopold. Stability is evaluated to determine if cracks will result in rupture. And finally, an in service inspection model is included to model inspections and results of repairs. Each underlying model is implemented deterministically within the probabilistic aspects coming from the framework and the values of the sample. All models were verified through a suite of tests and validated through comparison against laboratory or field data. So for the loads, XLPR allows the user to input both normal operating loads and transient loads. For the normal operating loads, included are cluster, dead weight, and thermal loads. These can be defined for up to three operating periods. Hoop and axial welding residual stresses can also be input with different stress profiles applied before and after mechanical lubrication. Furthermore, there is an input that can be used to adjust the value of the stresses at the inner diameter surface in both the hoop and axial directions. Three main types of transients are included in XLPR. Type 1 transients are temperature pressure time histories and are used to model transients such as heat up and cool down or other normal or offset thermal transients where temperature and pressure vary with time. Type 2 transients represent thermal stratification transients. Stresses from this type of transient represent global bending and membrane stresses associated with stratified flow during a transient. Type 2 transients are always associated with type 1 transients. And type 3 transients are meant to model mechanical transients and include membrane and global bending stress inputs. For example, you can model an operating basis earthquake using a type 3 transient. Finally, there are earthquake loads, 
which model safe shutdown earthquakes. Um, and those are used to contribute to stability, uh, but do not contribute to crack initiation. So for transients, up to 20 of them can be input into XLPR. For each transient, the user can define the interval over which the transient may occur based on a start time and an end time, along with a frequency with which the transient occurs. A front back loading ratio specifies when within each interval the transient should occur, so either if it's loaded, for, if it smaller front back loading value would have the transient occur earlier within that window, whereas a greater value for that input would have the transient occur later. And so, for example, a value of 0 0.5 would mean that the transient occurs in the middle of the interval. And finally, uh, the number of cycles uh, specifies how many load cycles are modeled for each transient when it occurs. Users can also input their own welding residual stress profiles in text LPR. These profiles can be defined for up to 26 points through the thickness of the component. Each point in the welding residual stress profile is input with an associated two wall percentage. Welding residual stress profiles in XLPR are modeled as axisymmetric, so they do not vary around the circumference. XLPR users are able to define weld residual stress profiles for both axial weld residual stress, which are applied to the circumferential cracks, and hoop weld residual stress, which is applied to axial cracks. And then different profiles for hoop and axial weld residual stress can be applied both before and after mechanical mitigation. The WRS inputs can either be constant or normally distributed. For norm normally distributed input profiles, the user can select a point-to-point uh, -point correlation coefficient to help mitigate the sawtooth effects that would otherwise occur when sampling WRS at each point through the thickness of the component independently. So included in the XLPR release um, is a library that contains several example WRS profiles. So to de develop these profiles, part of the XLPR development efforts, four independent uh, weld residual stress modeling experts were all tasked with modeling the same components following the same set of general assumptions. Some modeling details, such as their own codes, meshing, or repair modeling details were left up to the modelers. The results were then combined to develop these example profiles. With modeled uncertainties for the distributed weld residual stress inputs, derived from variation between the profiles developed from the individual modelers. We provided with XLPR are profiles for a Westinghouse reactor pressure vessel nozzle, um, a Westinghouse steam generator nozzle weld, and a B&W reactor coolant pump nozzle weld. For each weld, either a no repair, uh, a 15% through wall repair, or a 50% through wall repair profile is provided where the repair depth is assumed to be constant all the way around the circumference. And then literature solutions were then applied to come up with post-mitigation weld residual stress profiles for weld overlays, mechanical stress improvement, and inlays. So key references for more information on loading and weld residual stress inputs include the weld residual stress uh, subgroup report, as well as the weld residual stress portion of the theory training, and also the user manual, which has an appendix session focused on this reference. So one of the elements of the XLPR code is the calculation of stress intensity factors for model cracks to evaluate crack growth. Rather than applying an influence coefficient based approach, which requires a stress profile to be described by a polynomial up to fifth order, the universal weight function method, which does not require a polynomial fit, was implemented in XLPR. This allowed for more accurate case solutions when considering more complex uh, well of the stress profiles that are not easily defined using polynomials. 
In the weight function approach, the product of the weight function and the stress profile are integrated over the crack test to obtain K. The stress intensity factor calculation models were developed in XLPR for calculating K for axial, circumferential, semi elliptical surface cracks on the inner diameter, which are implemented in the uh, KPW module, as well as axial and circumferential idealized through all cracks, which is implemented in the KTW module. The crack transition module, which I'll discuss later, provides adjustments to the stress intensity factor solutions for the transitioning trapezoidal through wall crack. So by assuming that the stress profile varies as a piecewise linear stress profile, as is shown in the bottom right figure, um, closed form solutions could be derived to evaluate the weight function interval that I showed on the prior slide. Uh, these closed form solutions are what is implemented in XLPR. For circumferential cracks, the contribution on K from the global bending stress is also considered. It is noted that for through wall cracks, through all average welding residual stresses are considered when determining the stress intensity factor rather than applying the piecewise linear stress profile that is applied for part through wall flaws. The figure on the bottom left shows a comparison of K values obtained using finite element models and using the universal weight function method, demonstrating the accuracy of the approach. This has been confirmed for highly nonlinear weld residual stress. It is important to note that for surface cracks, K is calculated at the surface and at the deepest points. Uh, for through wall cracks, only one K is averaged over the uh, entire crack front. For transitioning through wall cracks, Different adjustment factors are calculated on the inner and outer diameter, resulting in two different Ks at the inner and outer surface cuts. Tiffany is a standalone preprocessor in the um, input set that prepares cyclic stress intensity factor, um, transient rise time, and cyclic stress values for transients, which are then used in XLPR. These calculated values are used as inputs to the fatigue crack initiation and growth calculation. Changes in coolant temperature produce stresses in the walls of the model piping. And these are called radial gradient thermal stresses. The changes in coolant temperature lead to cyclic stresses, which can then contribute to fatigue. Tiffany is able to model the three transient types considered in XLPR. Type 1 transients, which are thermal transients, type two transients, which are the stratification transients, and type three transients, which are mechanical transients. So as I mentioned before, the type one transients are defined using pressure, temperature, time history, whereas the type two and type three transients have a membrane and bending stresses that are input into Tiffany. So as Tiffany is a preprocessor, its outputs are lookup tables for the cyclic stress intensity factors, transient rise time and cyclic stresses for each transient and they're defined as a function of the crack shape. These lookup tables are then read in and interpolated by the uh, XLPR framework during runtime. So here are a few references that are useful if you're looking for more information on the stress intensity factor calculations in XLPR. There's the, the model subgroup report for the case solutions, as well as a model subgroup report for Tiffany. The theory manual had separate sessions on case solutions as well as on transient modeling. And the user manual has appendix sections that further discuss the case solutions and the Tiffany preprocessing module. So in XLPR, Initiation is defined as the emergence of a flaw of engineering scale on the order of maybe half of a millimeter to several millimeters in depth. Uh, the simulation of micro-sized flaw growth and coalescence is not modeled in XLPR. Both PWSCC and fatigue initiation mechanisms are included and can be evaluated individually or both at the same time. However, if PWSCC and fatigue are considered, they are modeled separately from each other. So the effects are not superimposed for the purposes of initiation 
and there is no correlation between the models. Additionally, an initial flaw model allows the user to model flaws existing at the beginning of the simulation time. Initiation model parameters were calibrated using a combination of field and laboratory data, and so the models are semi-empirical. The approach was selected as initiation is difficult to describe from a more mechanistic first principle standpoint. Earlier in the presentation, I talked about the different time periods for loads or operating conditions, as well as changes to load residual stress profiles associated with mechanical mitigation. So to account for these changes and factors which may uh, influence initiation, a miner's rule type approach is applied to calculate cumulative damage over time. For each time period, damage is calculated with initiation models once damage equals or exceeds one. A component in XLPR is spatially discretized into n subunits around the circumference. All subunits are modeled to be of equal length. The first subunit is centered at zero radians at the top dead center of the weld. The subsequent subunits are coincident with the edge of the prior subunit. This goes all the way around the circumference with no overlap between the subunits. Each initiation model determines an initiation time for a discrete volume of material. So the initiation models are called for each crack orientation in each subunit at the start of the simulation. So as I mentioned, PWSCC and fatigue initiation are modeled separately. If both are considered, the initiation time for given subunit orientation is based on whichever of the two initiation mechanisms is modeled to occur first. When crack initiation is modeled to occur within a subunit, the circumferential location of the crack within the subunit is determined by uniformly sampling location within the bounds of the subunit. The axial location of a crack is always assumed to be within the center line of the weld. Once a crack initiates, other crack-specific properties, such as initial length and initial depth, are sampled by the framework. So as I mentioned, the uh, XLPR initiation models are semi-empirical, containing functional dependencies for conditions that are known to have strong impacts on initiation. Three different PWSCC initiation models are available on XLPR, two direct models and a Weibull model. Each of these models contains failure time model parameters, which are calibrated based on field data, and effects model parameters, which are calibrated based on laboratory data. Direct model one is based on the material index model, which includes dependencies for temperature and surface stress. The temperature dependence is defined using an Arrhenius term, and the surface stress dependence is captured using a power law. The model also includes the user-specified surface stress level, below which PWSCC does not occur. Direct model two adds effects of cold work on the SCC susceptibility by considering mechanical properties defining the material strength and strain hardening response. Again, the temperature dependence is captured using a Arrhenius term. The surface stress and cold work dependencies are related to the function of the material yield strength, ultimate strength, and elastic modulus. Direct model two also includes calculated stress thresholds which below which PWSCC does not initiate or above which PWSCC is modeled to initiate immediately. The Weibull model uses a Weibull failure time model, an Arrhenius term for the temperature dependence, and a power law term for the surface stress dependence. For the Weibull model, the stress threshold for initiation is fixed a stress of zero. So any positive stress would result in initiation. All three PWSCC initiation models include a zinc effects model, which applies a factor of improvement when the zinc concentration is above a given threshold. Fatigue initiation models are also developed for the carbon and low alloy steels, austenitic stainless steels, and nickel-based alloys. These models are all based and consider environmental effects such as temperature, sulfur content, dissolved oxygen content, and strain rate. For fatigue, it is noted that fatigue initiation models are focused on low cycle fatigue and do not consider damage accumulation due to high cycle fatigue. 
Some key references for more information on crack initiation models include the crack initiation model subgroup report, as well as uh, PWCC and fatigue crack initiation sections of the theory training, and also a user manual appendix section on crack initiation. So in modeling uh, the growth of cracks, XLPR considers the cracks to be one of three ideal supplied flush shapes. Either semi-elliptical surface cracks, as shown on the left, transitioning cracks as shown in the center, or idealized through wall cracks as shown on the right. The semi-elliptical surface cracks are modeled to grow in both length and depth direction. Transitioning cracks have different crack growth rates evaluated for the ID and OD flaw sets. And idealized through wall cracks assume the same crack growth rate on both the ID and OD sets. As some factors which may impact crack growth are sampled on a subunit by subunit basis, Adjustments are made in the framework to ensure cracks remain symmetric, consistent with one of the three model idealized flaw shapes. This is done by evaluating growth at one general surface tip and then using an average of the conditions at the two surface tips to evaluate the crack growth. The crack center location is then shifted to account for any asymmetric conditions at the crack surface tips. PWSAC and fatigue growth are assumed to be independent. So if both mechanisms are modeled in XLPR at the same time, calculated PWSEC and fatigue crack growth rates are added to obtain a total growth rate for a given time step. So in XLPR, you have the option of modeling either only PWSEC, only fatigue, or both mechanisms at the same time. The crack growth rate models include functional dependencies on predominant drivers of the growth, such as stress intensity factors, temperature, water chemistry, uh, material condition, or loading characteristics. Um, certain dependencies are not explicitly captured and are instead considered the uncertainty associated with each model. Um, these include effects on orientation with respect to the material or manufacturing, uh, cold work or residual plastic deformation, or differences in crack growth rates near interfaces, such as the heat effective zones or well dilution zones. The PWSEC growth model is based on the models developed in MRP55, MRP115, and MRP263 for alloys 600 and alloys 82, 182, and 132. These models are semi-empirical as well and include theoretical dependencies with laboratory data used to develop the model parameters. Included dependencies in the crack growth rate model are a power law dependence on stress intensity factor with optional stress intensity factor thresholds, and a radius temperature dependence, as well as factors for the dissolved hydrogen concentration, component to component, such as heat to heat or weld to weld, and within component, such as within heat or within weld variability, as well as a factor of improvement. PWSEC growth and other materials can be modeled using the custom growth model, which implements the same model form as shown above, but with the ability for the user to specify input values for each of those parameters. So for PWSEC, the user has the option to include a correlation between the sampled initiation and growth model parameters, allowing the user to investigate the potential assumption that materials with earlier initiation times also have higher crack growth rates. Material-specific fatigue crack growth rate models are included for nickel-based alloys, austenitic stainless steels, and ferritic steels. Like the PWSCC growth models, the fatigue models are semi-empirical, with parameters developed based on laboratory testing. The bases for the included model forms are new reg uh, 6721 for nickel light based alloys, code case N809 for austenitic stainless steels, and code case N643-2 for ferretic steels. All three models are based on Paris's law, which is um, DADN equals C delta K to the N. The nickel-based alloy model then for fatigue in air also uses um, additional alloy type, temperature, and load ratio dependencies. The environmental fatigue model adds a rise time dependence. 
dependency to that. The Austinetic stainless steel crack growth rate model uses Paris log with additional dependencies for stainless steel class, temperature, low ratio, and rise time. Now the general Fertig stainless steel crack growth rate model uses Paris law with additional dependencies for load ratio, rise time, and sulfur content of the material. The model has different regimes determined by sulfur content and rise time to reflect different degrees of environmentally accelerated corrosion. The transient schedule over the component lifetime determines when fatigue crack growth is evaluated and is handled by the framework. So the coalescence model is a set of rule-based conventions used for simulating the combination of two cracks based on their sizes, their shapes, and their locations. Uh, this simulates cases where two cracks, cracks close to each other may coalesce on a time scale faster than would be predicted by treating the growth of each of the two cracks individually, either due to crack interaction or surface cracks or due to local ligament collapse or through all cracks. Coalescence is implemented as a rule-based model with specific coalescence rules varying for different pairwise combinations of crack types, which I'll go into in a little bit. In all cases, coalescence is modeled between two cracks at a time. Uh, the potential for three or more cracks to coalesce um, is extremely rare. And in these situations, XLPR would model two or more sequential instances of pairwise coalescence. And the user can uh, investigate implications of this assumption by changing a coalescence direction input in XLPR from clockwise to counterclockwise or vice versa. All circumferential cracks are assumed to be coplanar and have the potential to coalesce with other circumferential cracks if the coalescence proximity rules are met, which define how close the cracks have to be together in order for them to coalesce. For XLPR, axial cracks initiate in separate circumferential subunits and are not modeled to interact. Therefore, circumferential cracks are also not, um, sorry, furthermore, uh, circumferential cracks are also not assumed to uh, interact with axial cracks. So this slide and the next slide will provide a summary of the coalescence rules showing the resulting flaw shape of the coalesced crack giving the two input flaw shapes. Additional rules exist for defining the coalescence distance, which is the distance between two cracks before they coalesce, as well as the resulting geometry of the coalesced crack, including the inner half length, the outer half length, and if applicable, the depth. And so here you see that two surface cracks coalesce to form another surface crack, uh, two transitioning cracks coalesce to form another transitioning crack, and two idealized through all cracks coalesce to form an idealized through all crack. Then when you have two different crack types that coalesce, they form a transitioning through all crack. So a surface crack and an idealized through all crack form a transitioning through all crack. A surface crack and a transitioning crack form another transitioning crack. And a through all crack and a transitioning crack also form a transitioning crack. So key references for the crack growth and coalescence models include the crack growth and coalescence model subgroup report, sections in the theory manual on PWSCC growth, fatigue initiation growth, and crack coalescence, as well as user manual appendix sections on the crack growth rate model and crack coalescence model. So I've talked about transitioning cracks a little bit. Um, when a surface crack grows through wall, you need to consider what the initial through wall crack size should be and determine what the appropriate crack length should be on the ID number. So going directly from an idealized through wall crack, um, sorry, from an, an idealized surface crack to an idealized through wall crack uh, with an equivalent crack area at the time of leakage, what results in inaccurate leak rate prediction. So this motivated the implementation of the transitioning through all crack type, and thus the crack transition module. 
The crack transition module calculates adjustments for the stress intensity factor and crack opening displacement solutions for both axial and circumferential transitioning through wall cracks. So these adjustments are made by applying factors to the corresponding K and COD solutions for idealized through wall cracks with the same ID flaw length. Then the applied correction factors are developed based on finite element model. So again, contrary to what's shown in, in the figures here, the transitioning through all cracks are modeled more as trapezoids and not as ellipsoids. Um, the, the framework determines the geometry of the initial transitioning through all crack, as well as the transitioning through um, as well as when, when the crack transitions to be an idealized through wall crack. So surface, model, uh, surface cracks are modeled to transition to a transitioning through wall crack when the depth exceeds 95% through wall. The initial inner uh, outer half length is then defined as the minimum of the component thickness and the inner half length divided by four. The transitioning crack then grows using the Ks calculated with the help of, of the stress intensity factor calculation module and also the crack transition module until the ratio of the inner half length to the outer half length becomes less than or equal to 1.05. At that point, the crack then transitions to being an idealized through wall crack and continues evolving in time as an idealized through wall crack. For more information on the crack transition model subgroup report, um, also in the crack transition section of the theory manual and the user manual appendix section of the crack transition. Crack opening displacement, or COD, is an input to the leak rate calculation. Models for estimating the COD for both circumferential and axial idealized through all cracks have been implemented in XLPR. Both models are based on the GE EFRI methodology for predicting crack opening displacements, where the elastic and plastic influence functions are fit to finite element results. The total COD is then the sum of the elastic and plastic contributions. Now, the XLPR COD models are an extension of the GEFRI solutions in that they consider combined tension and bending load cases, as well as extend the ranges over which the elastic and plastic influence functions are applicable. So that's a, a greater range of pipe mean radius to thickness ratios and normalized crack, crack lengths that are included. The COD models are implemented as lookup tables as a function of component geometry crack length, and strain hardening exponents. The COD models are then output COD values at the pipe OD, ID, and halfway through the pipe thickness. Circumferential COD includes contributions from tension, bending, and crack face pressure loading contributions. Axial COD includes contributions from pipe internal pressure, weld residual stress, and crack face pressure with the weld residual stress being applied through an effective pressure change. So as I discussed previously, the crack transition models calculate correction factors for the COD in the case of transitioning through all cracks. So the, the couple of figures that are below here provide an example of what a large or a small COD would look like. So the leak rate model uh, determines the leak rate of fluid flow through a crack for a given crack size, pressure, temperature, and cracking mechanism. These calculations are performed by solving for equations developed by Henry and Faust to represent fluid flow through a long pipe in which steam generation occurs, resulting in two phase flow. In order to more accurately adapt these equations to fluid flow through a crack, Modifications to the equations are made 
to account for pressure losses due to entrance effects, basic acceleration, friction, flow path deviations, flow area changes, and crack morphology effects. Surface roughness, the number of turns, and flow path length are all key crack morphology parameters. Leopor is available as standalone software and also as an XLPR preprocessor. The preprocessor is used to generate leak rate tables as a function of crack length and crack opening displacement for a set of bounding pressure and temperature combinations and for both PWSCC and fatigue cracking mechanisms. The XLPR user inputs crack morphology parameters for SCC fatigue as well as minimum and maximum pressure and temperature limits for which the leak rate tables are generated. During runtime, the framework then interpolates these tables for a given pressure, temperature, thickness, inner crack length, and COD to determine the leak rate for a given crack during a given time step. XLPR also allows the user the option to apply uncertainty on leak rates that are low, such as less than 4 GPM. Leopor is based on the same thermohydraulic model as Squirt, but includes several improvements, including modifications to account for crack morphology. The four fluid flow phases are implemented in Leopor to produce a smooth transition in the calculated flow rate between the single phase orifice flow for subcooled liquids and the Henry Faust model for two phase choke flow in a tight crack regime. These flow regimes are all a function of the flow path length to the hydraulic diameter ratio. In addition to the two phase flow regime, which is regime one, and the orifice flow regime, which is regime four, two intermediate regimes are included. Um, regime two is a bridge regime for ratios of the flow path length to hydraulic diameter from 12 to 30, in which the tight crack model from regime one is used. Regime 3 is a transition regime for flow flat length uh, to hydraulic, hydraulic diameter ratios from 4.6 to 12, in which linear interpolation between the single phase orifice flow modeled in regime 4 and two phase choke flow modeled in regime 1 is applied. The leak rates are calculated assuming an idealized two wall crack shape, um, meaning that the crack opening areas on the ID and OD are the same but then adjustments are made in the framework to account for this assumption. By default, leak rate is calculated based on the inner diameter crack size. However, if the flow is in regime one, uh, the leak rates are then based on the ID and OD COD and then averaged. So key references for more information include the COD and leak rate model subgroup reports, as well as the theory training sections on circumferential COD, axial COD, and leak rate calculations. The user manual also includes appendix sections on the COD and on the leak rate model. So XLPR includes several different stability modules for circumferential cracks and axial cracks. Uh, the circumferential stability modules are implemented in SC fail and TWSCC fail for uh, surface crack and through all cracks, respectively. The axial crack modules are axial SC fail and axial TWC fail, again for surface cracks and through all cracks, respectively. When the XLPR stability models are called, they generally output whether or not rupture occurs for surface cracks. Um, the ratio of the current applied loads to the critical loads. And then for through all cracks, the ratio of the current crack size to the critical crack size. Rupture due to seismic conditions is also considered an XLPR. If stability limits are exceeded due to seismic conditions, then rupture is reported, but the simulation for that realization continues. However, if rupture occurs due to normal operating plus transient loads, then the rupture is recorded and the time evolution for that realization is ended. So for circumferential cracks, if one or more surface crack exists, 
a multiple net section collapse model is used to evaluate stability. This model is applicable to one or more circumferential cracks and evaluates stability under combined tension and bending load. Surface cracks are modeled as constant depth, and if any through-wall cracks are present, they are also considered in the multiple net section collapse model as deep surface cracks with a depth of 99% of the wall thickness. No EPFM model is implemented for surface cracks. Now, if any through-wall cracks exist, they are then also individually evaluated for stability using both net section collapse and EPFM models, also subject to combined tension and bending loading. After evaluating stability using both net section collapse and EPFM models, the solution that yields the smallest vertical crack size is then used for the output from the crack stability module. It is noted that for crack stability, through all cracks are modeled as ideal as through all cracks. The stability of transitioning through all cracks is modeled using an equivalent idealized through all crack with a crack half length equal to the average of the ID and OD half lengths of the transitioning crack. Axial surface cracks have stability evaluated using a plastic collapse analysis with the cracks modeled as constant depth surface cracks. Axial through all cracks have stability evaluated under both limit load and EPFM model. Um, again, the smallest critical crack size is then given the output from the axial crack stability. Axial crack stability is evaluated on a per crack basis meaning that no interaction is considered between multiple axial cracks. Neither of the axial crack stability models include effects of weld residual stresses. It is assumed that axial cracks and welds can be analyzed using the current axial crack stability models, um, even though the models were developed for cracks of homogeneous materials. As it is unlikely that axial cracks will be limiting uh, will be the limiting case for stability in dissimilar metal piping butt welds. Um, these assumptions were considered to be appropriate. Um, however, they can still be considered when interpreting and applying the results of the analysis. So for more information on the crack stability models, you can refer to the crack stability module subgroup report. The uh, theory manual, which has sections on circumferential through wall crack stability, circumferential surface crack stability, and axial crack stability, as well as the user manual appendix section on crack stability. In service inspections are also modeled in XLPL and contain two key parts an inspection model and an evaluation model. The inspection model utilizes a probability of detection curve as a function of the crack depth to determine if a crack is detected during a given inspection. The evaluation model is then used to size the detected crack, determining if that crack has a size greater than the threshold size for repair. Both models utilize crack depth as the independent variable. Other attributes of the cracks, such as the length of crack opening displacement, may also have an impact on flaw detectability or sizing. Um, however, these dependencies are part of the, the model uncertainty rather than being explicitly included. ISI model parameters recommended for use in XLPR um, in the model subgroup report were based on the APRI performance demonstration initiative or PDI program. And details of that are provided in MRP262 rep 3. In XLPR, the user has the ability to schedule in service inspections using either a frequency or by inputting the specific time of the inspection. Different inspection inputs, including inspection schedule, TOD models, and sizing models, can be provided to XLPR before and after the application. The inspection model is modeled using a probability of detection curve, describing probability of detection as a function of flaw depth. XLPR represents TOD using logistic equation, 
with a number of conventions built in to improve model flexibility to address small flaws and variations in performance between mock-up and field examination. The coefficients in the exponential term of the logistic equation are the main POD model parameter. Uh, the logistic equation model form has a convenient property of varying between zero and one with model parameters that can be varied to achieve different shapes and shifts in the overall curve. So this has been the model of choice for modeling probability of detection as a function of track size. And it's based on binary data, such as either detection or no detection. Because the ASME code requirements um, do not require flaws less than 10% blue wall for vendor qualification, the current PDI data do not quantify POD performance for small flaws. So XLPR includes options for treatment of POD for small flaws, which can either be modeled by linear interpolating a POD between a lower bound POD and a small flaw depth threshold, such as 10% through wall, or setting the POD in that depth range to zero. Um, the figure on the right shows the, the linearly interpolated option. So a POD effectiveness factor input can also be used to scale down the nominal POD curve as a way to model differences between laboratory and field performance. And the figure on the right, that effectiveness factor is shown by the, the dashed line. So the nominal form of the sizing model is a linear relationship between the measured flaw size and the actual flaw size. Um, and it has normally distributed uncertainty. Effectively, the sizing model determines how much the estimated size of a flaw is either under or over predicted. The depth sizing error term is also included and added to the nominal measured flaw size. Um, the sizing model is combined with the repair threshold input to calculate a probability of repair as a function of flaw depth. A using a repair depth threshold of zero would result in all detected flaws being modeled as being repaired. So the XLPR framework considers all modeled repairs as being perfect. This means that the uh, probability of additional initiation leakage or rupture due, a crack, due to a crack in that subunit is zero for the remainder of the simulation for that specific realization. So key references for the in-service inspection models, again, include the in-service inspection model subgroup report, uh, the theory manual, which contained two sessions on in-service inspection, one for model parameter development and one for model implementation. And finally, um, the user manual also has an appendix section on in-service inspection. And so with that, I'll pass it back to Matt. All right. Thank you very much, Marcus. Uh, we have concluded the technical discussion here and the presentation. Um, we've been keeping up with the questions and answers that have been coming in through the Q&A feature. Uh, I'd like to open it up now um, to just general questions and answers. Uh, we could take those uh, still through the Q&A feature. Also, uh, if you'd like to ask a question verbally, uh, go ahead and raise your hand, please. You can do that in WebEx. Uh, a couple different ways again. Um, you do this, uh, and we'll see you, and we'll we'll unmute you, so you so you can ask your question. Uh, so the steps that raise your hand are are different again. Um, if you're using the internet browser versus using the desktop client, and instructions are shown here um, on the left. There's the browser version. There, you'll first click on the three dots at the bottom of your screen and follow that click on the raise hand button. If you're in the desktop client, which you see on the right here, at the bottom of the screen you'll see a little hand symbol. Click on that and that, that will raise your hand as well. Okay, so again, general question and answers. Uh, please feel free to 
ask them uh, however you prefer. We have a question from Peter um, asking, well, residual stress uncertainty is perhaps better estimated by using uniform distribution. Is this possible to use as an input? Um, I believe the answer to that one is no. Currently, welding residual stresses, you can either model as only constant or as uniformly distributed, uh, normally distributed, sorry, not uniformly distributed. Um, most other inputs you have a little bit more flexibility on the distributions that are applied, but due to the added complications that come with the point-to-point -point correlation, uh, only normal distribution is available. Thank you, Peter, for your question. So we have a question from Akihiro, slide 34. Let's go there real quick. What is the meaning of damage? Does this mean leak or rupture? Um, so this, this is in terms of uh, tracking initiation. Um, and so it's, it's basically a way of accounting for how close you get to the initiation time um, within a time step under a certain set of operating conditions. And you can then use that to combine multiple time periods with multiple operating conditions, resulting in, um, in a way to determine when, when uh, cracks are modeled to initiate. So damage is in terms of initiation and not in terms of leakage or rupture in the context of slide 34. Thank you for your question. And Joel also has a question regarding an earlier part of the presentation. Um, if welds are limited by code and type, so ASME or AWS, or is there any allowance for novel methods such as internal friction weld? So I don't think XLPR quite gets into those sorts of welding details on how the weld is actually manufactured. Um, you just have the ability to uh, model certain material properties associated with each weld, which are mechanical material properties, as well as material properties associated with fatigue and PWSCC initiation, as well as fatigue and uh, SCC growth. So Ben has a question um, regarding axial cracks and how they behave um, if they reach the boundary of the material, so if they flow from the weld into the base metal, and if there's a step change in the crack or flow. And so, uh, yes, in that case, you would have a, a step change in the crack or flow. The, um, the crack or flow that is applied is associated with where the location of each crack tip is. So if an axial crack were to grow into the base metal, then you have the option of continuing to model crack growth in the length direction um, using the uh, crack growth models associated with the base metal.
So Ahikiro has a question. Um, when a crack is initiated by fatigue, can the crack propagate by PWSCC? Um, the answer is yes, if you are modeling both PWSCC and fatigue mechanisms. If fatigue happens to be the mechanism that results in initiation before PWSCC, then, um, then yes, the crack can also propagate by PWSCC. I think the only unanswered one now is the one from Yongsun Park is on the stability module. I think, I don't know if I fully understand the question, but I think it's asking for the two wall crack stability module. How how do you model that for a transitioning crack with different ID and OD wall size? And there the answer is um, you you model the stability of an equivalent idealized two wall crack that has a half length that is equal to the um, average of the inner and outer half lengths. And so you you average those half lengths to get an um, equivalent idealized through wall crack and then model through wall crack stability for that equivalent crack. Hopefully that answered the question. If not, uh, please submit another one and we'll, we'll try to get better clarification for you. We have a question from Jan. Um, what is the difference between thermal transient and its gratification? So the, the thermal transient is basically the portion of a, a transient where you're modeling changes in pressure and temperature and how those changes in pressure and temperature within the pipe um, result in changes in stresses. Whereas the stratification transient um, is used to model situations where some sort of changes in temperature then result in changes in um, membrane and bending stresses within the pipe for that particular And so I guess as as hopefully everyone is able to see over over the course of this presentation, um, you know XLPR gives the users lots of flexibility on what they want to model, and in in certain cases you have multiple models that you can use, and you know you can switch between those models to see how the answer differs. So it gives um, it gives a lot of flexibility to the users. Um, there's also a lot of complexity to all of the models as well, which is why we're, we're holding these seminars um, to, uh, to try to give a better overview and also, uh, you know, with emphasis, of there's, there's a lot of material out there um, that you can also use to find more information. And so this is just kind of a relatively high level overview um, with you know, the, the theory training providing the two and a half day version and then the, the user manual and uh, the various model subgroup reports then providing an even more in-depth version of that.
we had a follow-on question here uh, from Jan about the transients. Um, heat up and cool down is uh, similar to the stratification. So in XLPR with transients, uh, you can model uh, stratification with uh, normal heat up and, and cool down type, type transients, or you can just model the heat up and cool down aspect of the transient. So you get uh, one or both. Um, I'm sorry, you get either the thermal transients with stratification or without, but you, you can't ever have uh, just with stratification. And the third option, of course, is a, just a mechanical transient, not associated with the heat up or cool down. Yeah. So hopefully, hopefully that clears things up a bit there. So Jan has another follow-up question. Um, if we can look at thermal fatigue as a kind of mechanical way. Um, I think the the way XLPR models transients and um, it's kind of looking more at low cycle fatigue and and strain based uh, models and so I think I think some some modifications would be needed to be made to the models to properly model thermal fatigue. There's a question okay, on whether uh, irradiation-assisted stress corrosion cracking can be modeled. Um, the, the answer is no, not currently. Um, and the response here that was IGSCC. So it should be I I A S C C. Probably a typo there. Yeah. However, if um, if the model form matches the, the model form that it showed in the, the slides here, just jump there. Um, you know, the user has the ability to input their own model parameters for each of those values. So as long as you have, you know, some form that's a function of, of stress intensity factor to a power and has an radius term in it, um, you can you can use your own model inputs uh, to to model other types of to see code. Um, so, Gaojun has a, a question regarding weld metal, um, and so point is slide eighteen. indicates that um, normally we use uh, butter metal on the base metal and then use weld metal um, and asking um, when inputting material properties which material properties to input for the welds which should be weld metal, metal uh, butter metal or base metal and so in, in XLPR, you're able to input um, material properties for for the welds, and then also for the base metal for both the, the left pipe and the right pipe. Um, so I would I would be for the welds be inputting weld metal properties and not um, butter metal or heat affected zone 
for dilution zone type material properties. And yes, internal pressure is one of the inputs to Excel PR. And just to add on that, you can have the uh, pressure change um, throughout the course of the simulation uh, up to three different times. You can use different inputs uh, for different plant operating periods. Uh, so you can have, for example, uh, a constant in operating period one. You might want to have uh, distribution in operating period two, and you can have a different distribution in operating period three. You, you get a little bit of flexibility there, and that's true for temperature and the loads as well. So, Youngson has another question um, regarding the Heat up and cool down transients, how the transients interact with the internal pressure. And so those, those transients are defined using a uh, pressure, temperature, or time history, um, where the, the input values are actually the change in pressure and change in temperature from the normal operating pressure and temperature conditions. So you basically have a table that you can fill out um, with points in time. And then in addition to the points in time, you have pressure values and temperature values. And by filling out that table, that's how the, the transient is defined. So all in all, there are you know, probably several hundred uh, inputs in XLPR. Um, and this is to, in order to give the, the user flexibility and also um, you know, control for, for modeling all of these different uh, complex uh, models. Um, and so the, the next session that we will be, be holding will be focused on the input specifically and showing the user you know, how, how to set up the inputs for a given run. That'll, that'll help provide more information there. I think we're caught up on the questions. Does everyone else, anyone else have a question or uh, need clarification? You can raise your hand and we can open the mic for you and we can have a discussion on it. So Joel was asking if the, the model allows for load changes during crack development, and changes from tensile loads to compressive loads. Um, the answer is yes, it does. Um, for example, in the, the different uh, time frames, you can have uh, different loads associated with each um, which each of the three time periods that are considered. And so say the first one could be tensile, which results in crack initiation, and then the second can be compressive, um, in which case you wouldn't have any, any crack growth due to SEC during that, that time period. 
And then in the third, you could then maybe have something that causes it to be tenfold. So you continue your share of growth. And I guess if you wanted to look at a certain aspect of that too, you could also um, put in your own WRS profile to and influence how the, uh, the crack was, the loads, you know, you can make them compressive or tensile that way. Appreciate everyone's uh, questions here today. I know we've thrown a lot of uh, technical details at you in this in this meeting, uh, but again, we're just trying to make sure that we are explaining what kind of features the code has, and a lot of that has to do with uh, the models that are contained within it. Changsik has a question regarding the fatigue post calculation. Um, if incremental damages are extrapolated by multiplying a certain amount of cycles, or are fatigue incremental damages updated each cycle? So for fatigue crack growth, um, during each time period, each one month time period, um, if the transient is modeled within that specific cycle, uh, time period, um, then all growth due to that transient is modeled. And um, basically the, the crack size is then increased uh, accordingly um, during, during that same time step. So Peter, um, for your question on uh, if wall residual stress is not included in the leak rate calculation, um, then the largest non-conservative estimate will be obtained just after the two well crack has been created um, using the, the non-idealized geometry of the crack. And you're wondering what our comments are on that. And uh, yeah, you're right about that. And that's just... Um, that's uncertainty that is uh, included in the leak rate calculations. And that's part of why um, in, in the framework, the user has the option of applying additional uncertainty on uh, leak rates uh, that are relatively low to try to capture some of that uncertainty. I also wanted to just add on to that is that uh, NRC Office of Research is um, sponsoring a study right now on WRS effects on uh, crack opening displacement, which of course affects the leak rates. So we'll be looking for the results from that to uh, form any uh, enhancements to XLPR.
Um, also, also back on the WRS on the leaky uh, effects, uh, we, we do consider WRS in the axial uh, crack opening displacement calculations. So John's saying for the next presentation, uh, Q&A works better than the raise hand option. So I think, yeah, I think we'll probably stick with that. Yeah, th thank you for pointing that out, John. Okay, any uh, final questions on the presentations today? Let's give it a moment here to see if any others uh, trickle in. Looks like it to me. Um, Marcus had a number of references here to all of the uh, technical materials that are going to come with the code, um, be that in the uh, two and a half day uh, theory training session um, or the user manual itself or is the um, part of the uh, technical reports that we're going to uh, make, make available. So those get into uh, much more detail on all these aspects, and um, you're welcome to, you know, consult those um, to help answer some of your questions. Uh, of course, uh, we'll have the follow-on uh, webinars too, where you can uh, bring some of those issues up as well. Okay, so uh, move on to the closing remarks uh, portion of the agenda now. Uh, today's meeting, we provided an overview of the models programmed in XLPR. And today's meeting was a part of our webinar series surrounding the XLPR public release. So looking ahead, we have some uh, additional sessions planned. Uh, these will be one, every one to two weeks. And while the session on the April 23rd and today was targeted for more of a general audience, these next three events are going to be targeted for actual users who, who have the code. Uh, so these dates are, are tentative right now. Um, what we're going to do is is wait and see. Um, we have a, enough uh, user community built up where it would make sense to have one of these se sessions, and that's when, it, when we're going to have schedule the first one. Um, here, they're every two weeks, and we've been talking about maybe just doing them uh, every week. So might just be a, a series of three weeks where we would hold these sessions, but sessions themselves will be the same. Uh, we will announce uh, a firm schedule for those as soon as we think uh, that um, we have enough users to, to support them. So look for our announcements on those. Um, again, these will be to demonstrate some of the key features of the code itself and provide hints and tips. And again, we'll devote uh, a good portion of those sessions to uh, interact with users and answer any questions that they may have. Uh, the first one is going to be on setting up the inputs. Um, so we'll, we'll talk there about setting up some of the simulation odd options and defining the distributions um, and working with the input spreadsheet and the sim editor. Uh, to prepare for that, we, we would recommend, but it's not required, uh, that you uh, take a look at the Excel pair input set file. That's the, the spreadsheet. Uh, in your release package, that, that's file XLPR 2.1 input set.xlsx. There's also uh, module three of the uh, XLPR TN, TRN introduction. That's an, another one of the training manuals that will be included with XLPR version 2.1. Um, that's a, a hands on training session, a two and a half day training. The video you can watch, um, section three 
or mod module three rather uh, in that uh, it's focused on the inputs. And then I uh, also recommend that you look at the user manual. And there's probably a variety of things there you might want to look at, but uh, section 3.3 .3 covers the input specifically uh, as well as Appendix B. Uh, so that's some reading you may want to do after you get the code and before uh, the first uh, webinar here we have for the users. Uh, after the inputs, we'll, we'll talk about running the simulation uh, using GoldSim and the, and the settings there. Um, debugging some of the errors and things like that. And then uh, we'll follow that up with uh, another session on accessing the results from, from a simulation. Um, extracting those out of the code and then uh, also setting up some additional outputs if you'd, if you'd like to do that. So again, these are great opportunities to get involved with uh, learning about the code as a user. And we highly encourage uh, everyone to take advantage of that. All right, so thank, I want to thank everyone for uh, joining here today. Uh, look for, again, those announcements on those uh, training webinars, as well as for announcement on the actual XLPR code release. Greg, did you want to add anything? Okay, Craig, just interrupt me uh, if you would like to. Um, so if, again, if you have any questions, you can reach out to Craig or I. Uh, we, we monitor these email addresses, xlprnrc.gov and xlprevery.com. Matt, I, uh, I, I was speaking into a muted phone. I have two mute buttons and they weren't synced. So yes, we, we appreciate everyone's participation today, the active, uh, uh, interaction with questions and uh, look forward to delivering the code to you very shortly and your participation in future training and use of the code and your feedback. Yeah, th thanks, Ray. That's well, well said. Okay. All right, that's uh, that's all we had for today. I uh, just want to remind everyone after the meeting ends, if you would like to provide feedback and help us understand your views about this NRC meeting and potentially improve future NRC meetings, um, you can do that. Um, and just go to nrc.gov, look for the public meeting schedule webpage, and click on show recently held meetings, and you can find this meeting listed there. Um, click on that, and then there'll be a meeting feedback form you can you can submit right there. So please uh, do that if you feel like you can help us. Um, otherwise, that's uh, all we have today. We'll we'll send out a, a meeting summary and then also rewatch this video, of course, on on YouTube. So thanks very much, everyone, and we look forward to seeing you uh, at the next webinar on the XLPR inputs. Thank you. We'll adjourn. <laughs>